The presentation that I'm going to share with you is a presentation which, in various evolving forms, I've given over the past 15 years in the UK Defence Academy, uh, to the Irish military. Um, I've also given it at St. Cyr Military Training um, um, School in France and at a centre for NATO training in the Partnership for Peace programme in Geneva. So I've given it in quite a number of places and it's evolved all the time. It's evolving all the time as the history of war changes. And basically what it is that in senior military training and normally I teach in, as a guest speaker once a year on the advanced and more recently also the higher command and staff course, which is the one that trains people to become generals and the equivalent. I represent to them my personal understanding, and I, I stress that it is coming from that perspective, of what the basis for nonviolent direct action is. The reason I stress that is that I'm coming at this from a basis of spiritual activism, of a spiritually grounded position, which not all proponents of nonviolence take. For example, Jean Sharp, who's very well known in the field, does not rely on a spiritual basis. He relies on the utilitarian basis that nonviolence is effective. What I'm going to do tonight is I'm just going to talk to you as if I'm talking to the military. And I'm going to allow you, I'm going to invite you, and I've done this several times before, and they, they know that I do this at a staff college. They've even allowed me to be videoed giving the talk a couple of times so that I can use it in this context, because I've said to them I need to be accountable to my own peers in the peace movement if I'm speaking to you about nonviolence. So I need to be able to show what I say. At the same time, I'm circumspect about it, because I'm aware of the privilege of being allowed into these highest levels of military training. And it would be, I think, felt a little bit... Um, it would make them a little bit uncomfortable if, for example, the slides I'm going to be showing you tonight, and especially some of the more horrific ones of war, went on the web in that association. So I've asked tonight that I can be recorded, but my slides are just for sharing personally with you, and I don't want them to get out in the wild there and people to be saying, look, this is what they do in the UK Defence Academy. It's just out of respect for the implicit contract with those people. And indeed, when I go there, the Chatham House rule, I put one or two introductory slides here that I wouldn't normally use with them. The Chatham House rule is paramount. That when a meeting or part thereof is held under the Chatham House rule, participants are free to use the information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any other participant may be revealed. So I won't be naming names tonight, but I will be talking about the kind of discussions that they have with me about war and allowing you to critique that in question time. So here is the Joint Services Command and Staff College at Shrevenham. Um, all of this, um, you, you know, what happens at Sandhurst is for junior officers. This is the senior officer training base for um, all three of the services and also things like military police and indeed officers from some 60 different countries get trained there who are in military alliances with the UK. And I don't have a picture of myself at the podium, but that would typically be, uh, this is the lecture theatre that holds 400 people that I normally speak in on the advanced course with the higher course. It's a much smaller group of about 30 because um, they're, they're training for the, for the highest positions there. And um, that's a military ethics conference at the base. And you'll see that when I speak to them, I put my uniform on. That is to say, I wear my kilt. <laughs> I'm not doing that tonight. But otherwise, um, you know, I don't normally wear suits. Well, I don't wear suits and ties, put it like that. And it's just, it's a, it, 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 it's a, a, a compromise place that makes it mutually comfortable um, when I go and do things. Uh, there's my military purse um, when I <laughs> go there, unescorted. <laughs> And the first thing you will learn from this is that they have a sense of humour. <laughs> uh, because to be unescorted means that I'm basically trusted when I'm on site there. I don't have to have a minder. Um, at the same time, there can be a bit of a laugh about it. Um, I'm not pretending to be one of them. Um, so on the, um, 
advanced command and staff course, the teaching materials here, which includes my paper that um, is published in their book. Um, it's nothing secret, it's quite open, they tell me. Um, in this book on military ethics edited by David Wetham, I've got a paper which is basically the talk that I give, or an academic version of it. And if you Google my name and um, mil military stuff, you'll quickly come across a PDF of that paper on my website. Um, this is a cover of the study guide for the Higher Command and Staff course. And when I looked at it, I did a double take. It looked very familiar, that picture, and yet somehow unfamiliar. And it took me a little while to realise that that picture is actually one of our protests at the Faslane Trident nuclear submarine base, but seen from their side of the barbed wire instead of from our side of the barbed wire. Um, so basically, a summary of the brief that I generally get um, is given here to explore the moral implications of conflict that exceeds military capacity to contain it and the application of non-violence, including its religious basis, to achieve security in a complex world where the net results of conflict are not easy to predict. So this is one of the remarkable things, that the senior military have seen all the blood and guts in Afghanistan and Iraq. Many of them have participated in that. Many of them, in my experience, are very uneasy about nuclear weapons because they consider that they are unconscionable and militarily unusable. Not all of them feel that, but many do. And many feel that particularly the invasion of Iraq was an injudicious war and Afghanistan is now speaking for itself. So I actually find a tremendous openness to the message that I'm putting across when I'm speaking to the military. At one level, they will tell me, as one brigadier said, I think that you are mad, quite frankly. At another level, they listen very carefully and deeply and critically, and we really enter into some heart-to-heart -heart engagements about how do you seek security in the kind of world that we are living in. And I put it to them, of course, at the hydra of war. This is from the Craig Lockett War Hospital, the poetry magazine of poets like Sigrid Sassoon and Wilfred Owen in the First World War. I put it to them that the problem with the hydra of war is as soon as you cut off one head of it, another dozen heads spring up. And that this is a fundamental issue that the use of violence fails to see and address. And this is why we protest war, lest we forget. Now, this image is from the, a painting, is from the Battle of Omdurman in um, the present-day Sudan in 1898. And it is the, one of the last battles in British military history in which the British army charged on horseback. And one of those young soldiers is on the left here, charged in with a sabre by his side and a pistol in his hand, and his name was Winston Churchill. And here he is by the end of his career. And so he went in as a young man with a sabre by his side. By the time that his military career was over, military technology had changed so dramatically that this was the scene that was dominating the paradigm. And I put the question, has our ethical and social context kept pace with the scale of military technology? Is it still keeping, keeping pace now that there are drones, etc., in use? Is the technology and our moral capacity in step, or has it gotten seriously out of step? Because this is what nuclear war does, these images from Hiroshima. And I need hardly labour the point there. Strange, isn't it, the way the church is kind of left standing there? Even Churchill himself, in the firebombing of German cities, where, what was it, something like 200,000 German civilians slaughtered, by us and the Americans, asked the question, are we beasts? Are we taking this too far, according to one of his biographers? And I put that to them, I frame that to them as a Churchillian question, that we must ask today, are we beasts? Are we taking it too far? Because when you've got things like Trident nuclear submarines, what happens if it wasn't the Twin Towers 
but one of those submarines docked in the Clyde as I came back from the Hebrides the other day, flying down from Stornoway to Glasgow in order to get down here, get down to London by train to give a talk on Monday. As I came over, I saw a nuclear submarine sailing down the Clyde estuary. What would happen if a maverick airline pilot decided to fly into it? You wouldn't have full nuclear explosion, but you would have a really messy, dirty bomb type effect as the conventional explosives scattered the warhead fissile material. And if the wind was blowing the wrong way, you could basically say bye-bye to central Scotland, which of course is why nobody wants them down in Davenport or anything like that. They're too dangerous. They make us a target. And You'll be aware of the politics just now that this goes on to destabilise the very thing that they're meant to be stabilising, i.e. the construct of the United Kingdom. Because one of the main reasons why many of us in Scotland, or I should say about a third of us in Scotland, according to present polls, want independence is because we are so sickened by the military driving of Iraq, Afghanistan and nuclear weapons being rebuilt in a new wave of submarines to be located in Scotland. It's just not on. It's just not on. And so I say to them, you are leading to insecurity by the very drivers of security. This is why all of us in the peace movement protest in order to survive. This is why we met the first Trident submarines coming in here in 1992. With these protests, there's the Christian c and boat out there. There's um, the Glasgow Quaker meeting, that's my wife there and um, Mary Alice there offering a white poppy to the nice policeman, etc. This is why we do that kind of thing. This is why we protest outside the Faslane base. And why people get arrested on this particular day, 400 people, including many clergy, were arrested. And why, at, in my opinion, at its deepest and most coherent level, the movement is a spiritual movement, as represented by these geisha girls reflecting on Hiroshima Day. It is about spiritual testimony against deep evil in our society. Now, for the military, especially for the older ones, the ones in the most senior training courses, the world has changed radically. Many of them say to me, it's changed because when we would come into the military, it was simple. The Russians were over there. We were over here. That's checkpoint, sorry, that's checkpoint Charlie there. So the Russians were, look at it from the North Pole perspective. The Russians were over there. We were over here. And our job was to keep it that way. Whereas today, it's not that simple. Today, you just don't know what's coming next or from where. You don't know necessarily who you're fighting for or for what you are fighting and to what extent it might be issues like resources rather than sovereignty of your own country. You have to ask, where are the front lines? Are the front lines on Iraq and Afghanistan or are the front lines with poverty in our own cities? Because we're not addressing deep need and that leads to this kind of violence that broke out with the riots in English cities in 2011? Or is, as the Chief Medical Officer for England suggested, is the front line antibiotic resistance? Is that what's going to kill more people? Because again, linked to insufficient or incautious, in imprudent healthcare, we're squandering the, the antibiotics we've got and we're not developing new ones because of the way the markets work and so on. Does that make the front lines of true security? What is true security? in the world in which we're living? Or is true security something that's to do with finance? Or perhaps a cyber world, computer networks? Look at the impact on ordinary people's security of the crash of the banks. Look at how many of you in this room have probably had or got accounts with the Co-op Bank and you're now owned by a hedge fund and all of that carry on. People in negative equity and so on. Where are the real threats? to the world today? Is it in the trenches of the First World War with Zeppelins? Or is it in the banking world and the canonization of greed in our economic system? So we've got to think wide about security.
and I put it to them that from a non-violent perspective, you don't narrowly focus it on shooting matches, on the kinetic side, as they call it, the guns and missiles and bullets and so on, of conflict. You have to look much wider at what is driving violence in the world. And if you don't look wider at what is driving it, if you don't try to understand the so-called enemy, then your own, your own security quickly unravels, as was the bombings during the G8 on the London Underground and on the bus here, making us a society that is now hyper-securitized and yet in a way that always feels like a bit of a con. Because I don't know about you, but every time I go through an airport, I play the game of, if I were the terrorist, how would I get through? And quite frequently, you can see a pathway by which you could slip through because somebody's not paying attention, or it's very busy, or, or whatever. And I don't know, but I don't know about you guys, but, well, they've got these whole body scanners now. I don't know about any of you, but, you know, in these body searches you do, the one thing that I've never had done to me is to be searched where I would actually hide something. <laughs> <laughs> now, the military aren't stupid, and the military recognise the changes taking place. So, um, General Sir Rupert Smith here says, our opponents are formless. Their leaders and operatives are outside the structures in which we order the world and society. Even if military action is on a big scale, and even if it is successful, the confrontation will remain to be resolved by other means and levers of power. And I make two points about that quotation. One is a sense of the structures in which we order the world, the neo-colonial implicit presumption that it is our part to order the world. And secondly, that the the confrontation, the roots of the confrontation will remain if violence is used and will have to be resolved by other means and levers of power. And I put it to them that that is where understandings of non-violence and how you build communities and societies becomes very important. Now, one of the main dynamics that we have seen in war in recent decades is the use of war by the media by people like Rupert Murdoch here, to drive political process. And Murdoch's not the only one. But just look at these images and think back of our British history. And for me, it kind of started, war became thinkable again. Back was the Argentinian War and the Sun's famous line, gotcha. That brought war back into something. You know, we'd all heard from our parents about the war that would end all wars and it wasn't going to happen again and the Cold War would keep it in check, but this opened the door to the acceptability of war. And then you had, you know, the sun backs Blair. And the next thing is Blair is in post and what's Murdoch telling him but was Kosovo bomb, bomb, bomb. The salesman of newspapers driving political process. Even The Guardian interpreting this, the Twin Towers, as a declaration of war, what was actually the work of a handful of Saudi dissidents. And of course, the famous Jonathan Powell to Alistair Campbell on the dodgy dossier, Alistair, what will be the headline in the evening standard of the, on the day of publication? What do we want it to be? This creation of the lie in order to justify the use of violence. And the idea that by toppling the figurehead of a dictator, you brought about regime change when you haven't dealt with the underlying structures of violence, which every day are killing more and more people in Iraq in car bombs and all the rest of it. Now, I want to look at three views of war. One view of war is what the military called realism, the maniacal megalomania of Dr. Strangelove or Karl von Clausewitz, the German strategist of war, with his idea that war must or may have to be absolute. You don't do war in half measures. You go the full whammy or else your enemy will. As um, General Thomas Powell put it here, at the end of the, at the, end of the war, if there are two Americans and one Russian left alive, we win. 
probably, well, I'm not so sure when you read the biographies of these people, I'm not so sure if it would have been tongue-in-cheek. At another level, you have the mainstream moral drift of contemporary, of most, at least, of all of the contemporary European military academies that I've spoken in, which is just war theory based on the teachings of Augustine of Hippo. And Augustine said, you know, all else must have been tried, war must be waged on legitimate authority, it must be proportionate and must not harm non-combatants. And he wrote a letter to Count Boniface saying, uh, when would this be? Around the end of the third century, I think it was, uh, was it early fourth century, around about then. We do not seek peace in order to be at war, but we go to war that we may have peace. Be peaceful, therefore, in warring, so that you may vanquish those whom you war against and bring them to the prosperity of peace. So the sense of nobel oblige of war, which Augustine, leaning on St Paul in Romans 13, sees as being divinely mandated, uh, where Paul says that the civil authorities are given the power of, so of the sword as part of the power of God and should exercise it accordingly. Trouble with just war theory, as I say to the military, is that it's not what Jesus of Nazareth actually taught. Jesus of Nazareth, and I bring out the full details in my military paper, um, Jesus of Nazareth taught full-on non-violence. He didn't teach just war, he taught non-violence. Until now, he said, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. But put away your sword, Peter. We shall have no more of this. You say, what about Islam? You know, it's all very well for us to be so good and Christianly about it, but you can't trust those Muslims, can you? Well, hang on a minute. If you look in Islam, you will find similar roots of non-violence, but generally we choose to ignore them in the same way as we choose to ignore them in Christianity. So the Quran has a very clear basis for just war, such as fight in the cause of God, those who fight you, but do not transgress limits, because God loveth not transgressors. More than that, there is a hadith, the oral tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in war, not to kill women and children, POWs to be treated humanely, no one should be killed by burning, also bodies shouldn't be mutilated, uh, don't mutilate the dead. You say, well, that's not how they carry on. Well, it's not how people who have been brutalised carry on, is it? It's not how we carry on when we have been brutalised too. And there's a fascinating passage in Surah 5, verses 30 to 35 of the Quran, which retells the Cain and Abel story, or shouldn't, I shouldn't say retells it, tells it in, from the Islamic perspective. And if I might just summarise from these verses, Abel says to Cain, if you remember, um, Cain came to slay his brother Abel because he was jealous. If you stretch out your hand to kill me, it is not for me to kill you because I respect God, I respect Allah, the cherisher of the world, the cherisher of the world. You will only draw down sin upon yourself. How is that for a powerful basis for Islamic nonviolence? How often do we hear that? But there it is, complete with the Arabic original. Um, similarly, in a Hindu context, Mahatma Gandhi unpacked the Hindi Sanskritic words ahimsa, which means literally without a, and himsa meaning literally to strike, without striking, without harming, and satya graha. Satya meaning truth, soul, or God, and graha meaning force. And Gandhi said the badge of the violent is his weapon, spear, sword, or rifle, but God is a shield of the non-violent. I find it a bit disturbing when I look in some books on non-violence, for example, Jean Sharp's trilogy, to find only a single passing mention of Gandhi in those three volumes, and no mention, in fact, somewhat poking fun at the spiritual basis of it. And I can see the justification in saying non-violence works in practice, that's all we need, the utilitarian argument. 
but it fails to do justice to where Gandhi was coming from. Um, similarly, I'm reviewing a, a book just now, I think Nigel Bigger is the author, if I remember rightly, called The Case for War. I'm reviewing it for next month's edition of Third Way magazine. And Bigger is an Oxbridge academic who attacks just war, um, sorry, who attacks the critics of just war theory, who attacks pa full-on pacifism. But he only has one passing mention to Gandhi and completely fails to understand the spiritual depth where people like Gandhi have been coming from. Dom Helder Kamara talks about the spiral of violence, and if we want to break violence, we have to identify the links where we can break it. The violence starts off, oopsie, woohoo. That thing ran away with me. Uh, it starts off with the primary violence of injustice, the structural violence that leads to poverty. And that leads to the secondary violence of rebellion by the poor and oppressed. But that causes a tertiary violence of repression by the powers that be, which further impoverishes the nation and therefore no more primary violence. What examples do we have of non-violence as a practical response to aggression? Well, there are a very great many examples now. Uh, to name just a few, let's not forget that countries like Greece and Portugal were, and Spain were military dictatorships up until the 1970s. Um, here's the coronation re revolution in 1974 in Portugal, so-called because the protesters were putting coronations into the barrels of the dictatorship's guns and their power kind of fell apart, not, because of, not just because of the coronations, but a much wider process of a re-empowerment of that society. Uh, you had non-violence toppling Marcos when the soldiers in the tanks refused orders to fire on their own people. Um, you had the bringing down of the Berlin Wall. And while the, while the politicians and the, many of the military like to suggest that the Berlin Wall came down because we had impoverished the USSR by being better at developing weapons than it did, so there was competitive impoverishment. In actual fact, I would remind you of those mass people's demonstrations, many of which were organised by East European Orthodox churches and caused the structures of violence to collapse from within. A powerful example here of the Queen shaking hands was McGuinness, the former leader of the IRA. Incredible, incredible. You know, when her father, was it her father or grandfather, I forget which, was murdered by the IRA. Uh, sorry? Uncle. Uh, uncle. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm not very good on the genealogy of the royal family, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, you know, I have to say, though, what a woman. And indeed, you know, what a culture. I think that that reflects very well on, on England and British culture, that that could happen. And at the Irish level, I mean, here's Ian Paisley and Bertie Ahern shaking hands. And Paisley saying, we both look forward to visiting the battle site at the Boyne, but not to refight it. I don't want Mr. Hearn to have home advantage. <laughs> My goodness me. Um, and of course, you'll be aware of the, the huge amount of work done by the Northern Ireland peace women and many others that helped, it, it has to be said, including Tony Blair, that helped to bring that about. The tragedy with Blair is that he went the way he did. Um, <laughs> Egypt. Egypt. And Jean Sharp, who I've mentioned a couple of times, his, his three volumes being studied by the activists in Egypt as they developed their tactics. Mm. And these, you know, this was a mass spiritual movement. It, it bothers me when I hear people denigrating the Muslim Brotherhood and saying the revolution was a secular revolution. I don't see a secular revolution going on in Tahir Square there. I see a very mixed revolution of both secular and Islamic. And it does feel to me as if that has not been entirely respected. 
Look how well organized it was. And look at these, some of these wonderful stereotype busting images. What does a Muslim mean to you? Some beautiful images came out of that. Now, of course, we know what's happened now. That Morsi was toppled, although democratically elected, because of the powers he was trying to take for himself. So this is still a very young revolution. And yet, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in Egypt have been touched by these approaches. And the understandings of non-violence are growing. You say, what about Syria? What about the death of a country? What about these floods of refugees entering Iraqi Kurdistan? What good is non-violence doing here? To which my reply is, well, what good would violence have done here? Which side would you back? Which of the many sides would you back? In doing that, uh, Cameron was on the brink of going ahead with war with no sign that Britain will wait for a mandate from the UN Security Council. In other words, Cameron and, tragically, Obama were on the brink of taking international law into their own hands when, thanks to the British Parliament, calm down. And that can be seen as a, that can be seen as a tribute to those protests that we made before the Iraq war, which failed then, but which caused our politicians to be curbed more circumspect this time round. And what we forget, what we don't see, because it doesn't get reported much in our media, is that right from the start of the Syrian con conflict, activists have been in deep dialogue with the various sides about bringing an end to the violence. But that has been ridden over roughshod by pumping weapons in and by taking away the avenues for peace. And yet some of those people, the ones who have not been killed, are still there. And last week I was doing a speaking tour up in the Outer Hebrides, which is where I'm from. And when I was in Castle Bay in Barra, I thought early in the morning I would go into the Catholic Church, Our Lady of the Star of the Sea. What a fantastic name. I'd go into the Catholic Church and just see what a Hebridean Catholic Church was like, because I had realised that the previous day when I'd gone to visit and shake hands with the much-famed tradition-bearer Canon Angus McQueen, who is 90 years old. That was the first time coming from the Protestant Northern Hebrides that I had ever shaken hands with a Roman Catholic priest in the Hebrides. Such is the depths of divide that our past violent history had brought about. And so I went into... Our Lady Star of the Sea Church. And as I was looking around, I noticed copies of the newspapers there, and I bought two of them, the Scottish Catholic Observer and the Catholic Herald. So these are last week's editions of both magazines. And basically, the news story was that the patriarch, as they call him, of the Catholic Church, the most senior Catholic priest in Syria, had been speaking in Glasgow and elsewhere in the UK and saying, Syria is enduring the way of the cross. Do not send weapons. Do not feed the violence. And that he is going back to Syria now in the full knowledge that he could well be killed. And yet, if we are to claim to be Christians, we must endure the way of the cross. Martin Luther King recognised the inadequacy of such a position. He said, I came to see the pacifist position not as sinless, but as a lesser evil in the circumstances. And I can assure you that, you know, when I acknowledge things like that to the military, you can feel them relaxing, because I'm not taking the holier-than-thou position. I'm saying we're all contradicted. We're all conflicted. But we have different perceptions of what represents the lesser evil in the circumstances. The Saffron Revolution in Burma. Substantially a movement of spiritual activism. Remember all the monks? And the monks being brutally beaten and tortured and imprisoned. 
The message, may all beings always be well and happy. May they be free from danger and enmity. May they live peacefully on the streets of Rangoon. <coughs> and then finally, Aung San Suu Kyi winning that election and now facing all the contradictions of political power. And yet what a shift there has been. What a shift is starting slowly to happen in that country. You say, what about Hitler? How would non-violence have been then? Well, the thing about the rise of Hitler is that the thinking about non-violence had not yet been properly developed at that point. You know, Gandhi hadn't fully done his thing. So many other situations had not developed. Non-violent thinking is really a movement in its modern sense of the second half of the 20th century. In an ancient sense, <clears throat> it was very strong in the early Christian church until such time as the Christian church became Romanized with the Emperor Constantine deciding that it would help hold the empire together if it became Christian. But prior to that, it was substantially a church based on nonviolence. So there wasn't much nonviolent thinking around at this time, and yet there were some remarkable examples. Um, I need to make up a slide set, I've not done it yet, because I only recently discovered about the Orthodox Church in Bulgaria which sheltered the Bulgarian Jews. The Orthodox Patriarch lay down on the railway lines in front of the trains and said, if you're going to ship out these Jews to death camps, you have to run over me first. And hardly a Jew was taken to the death camps from Bulgaria because of that. It's not something we often hear about a country like Bulgaria, but you Google it and you'll find reliable historical documentation on that. It needs to be much better known about. Um, in German, in, in Norway, with um, Wittgen Quisling here, the Nazi stooge, um, Hitler's right-hand man in Norway. The Norwegian teachers, some 11,000 of them, were required to teach a Nazi curriculum, and two-thirds of them signed a pledge refusing to. The, Na the, the Norwegian schools had to close. Quisling started shipping the teachers in trains up to concentration camps in the north of Norway on starvation rations and torture exercises. And the school children lined the platforms of the railway stations of the villages that those trains went through and sang patriotic hymns. Within a few weeks, Quisling had to capitulate because education wasn't happening. It was making the country difficult to govern. And he said in a speech, you teachers have destroyed everything for me because they went to the heart of the way in which an evil system could only continue with the complicity of the citizenry. And they broke that complicity. Because even the man himself says in Mein Kampf, in the long run, government systems are not held together by the pressure of force, but rather by the belief in the quality and truthfulness with which they represent and promote the interests of the people. So this shows the lines of weakness by which we can start to break the spiral of violence. And you know, let's not kid on that by getting rid of the madman, pulling down Saddam or whatever, we deal with the root of the violence. Tomorrow in our course, I'm going to be talking about charisma and cultic dynamics in spiritual activism. And for those of you who won't be there tomorrow, we're going to be looking at the now much acclaimed video clip of Russell Brand. For those of you who will be there tomorrow, don't check it out further. Just leave it until tomorrow because I want to see what you make of it. And we will just be examining what's going on in that, examining the dynamics and critically interrogating what is going on there and asking questions. But I'd like you just to look at this. This is not just Hitler that's behind Nazism. This is a whole movement that's going on. This is the movement in the human psyche that's going on here, and not one that we are immune from. This is a map run in the Daily Telegraph in 2012, suggesting there are only 22 countries in the world, the ones in white, that Britain has not at some point invaded or colonized, at least in part. And brutal histories of colonization. You know, we slaughtered hundreds of thousands in creating the British Empire, of which many Britons are still so proud. We say, well, we helped the Indians have trains that ran on time. And we forget about the battle in which, Battle of Buxter, for example, 11,000 
11,000 so-called moguls, i.e. resistance fighters, slaughtered in one day by an army led by a Scotsman called Sir Hector Munro, who then went back home and pushed his own peasants off their own land so he could make even more money by bringing in sheep onto the land. We forget our own complicity. It's not just the Germans who are the baddies. We need to look at the shadow in ourselves as well. We need to root out the violence in our history because who was it that armed Saddam anyway? Was it him? Did Bin Laden arm Saddam? Or was it us? Was it all of these countries, including Britain, that armed Saddam? We know the answer. We know why. Propping up corrupt dictatorships in order to keep the oil flowing through. And as Tony Blair now says, and look at the weariness in his face, life in Iraq ten years on is not as I hoped. War didn't end up doing what war was meant to do. The right war in Afghanistan. Is there such a thing as a right war, I put it to you? Can there ever be a right war? Some of these images coming up are very horrific. If you feel they might disturb you, you might want to close your eyes for a little bit and just listen. This is the blooded flak jacket of one of the five British soldiers murdered in Helmand. Their killer, an Afghan policeman they trained and trusted. What kind of war is this? What kind of war is this? Is this, as Donald Rumsfeld suggested, in Abu Ghraib prison, this brutal torture of prisoners, blood on the floor here? Is it merely isolated pockets of international hyperventilation? Or is this just what happens when men go to war and so quickly become brutalized? And what does the Islamic world make of it? When Gaddafi is murdered shortly after having rubbed noses with Blair and Blair rubbing noses with Murdoch, attending the baptism of Murdoch's daughter. Murdoch, I should say, a Scot with Presbyterian forebears. Uh, his grandfather and his great-grandfather were free church ministers in Scotland. What does the Arabic world make of this kind of vendetta? I don't see much of Christ saying, forgive not seven times, but seven times, 70 times. What is the Arabic world to make of this? What is the Arabic world to think of it? When Prince Harry boasts to a newspaper, I've killed Taliban. What is a young Muslim who's feeling angry about this in Britain going to think? Is it unreasonable that that young Muslim should think, I'm going to go out and kill people on the underground? Is that unreasonable? Is it not the same psychology? Do we really need to ask from where comes la peur, the fear of Islam? Might it just be a coincidence that the Islamic world happens to be the world that we colonized most and most early and most deeply and have continued to colonize through puppet regimes in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere to keep the oil flowing? These next four slides are particularly shocking. Somebody's daughter. Somebody's son. We might not have this in the front pages of our paper, but it goes out in Al Jazeera. Somebody's father. Somebody's mother or lover. This is what war does to human beings. This is what war does to children. Mohammed Abdul Bari caused outrage when he said in the Daily Telegraph, speaking under the heading of the Muslim Council of Britain, I deal with emotionally damaged children. Children come to hate when they don't get enough care and love. 
It makes a young person angry and vulnerable. These are the roots of war that we must tackle and stop nourishing. This is why the face of Western power, of American power, is portrayed as the face of death on the wall of the United States Embassy in Tehran. The problem is that we have an authoritarian Anglo-British military psychology, or I should say political psychology, because many of the military are more wised up than this. Political psychology under the Bush-Blair type era that sinks in black and white, demonizing the enemy, member good state, evil state, compartmentalization, splitting off of the darkness in ourselves and projecting that onto the enemy, and the enemy doing the same thing back, so that IRA transmogrifies into IRAN or IRAQ, because we never dealt with the colonial dynamics that caused Britain to have a problem with the IRA. Most British people still do not know about the two genocides committed by the British in Irish history. One was the Cromwellian invasion, and then the other was allowing the famine to happen while food was still being exported to British cities from Irish land under armed guard. We don't get taught that kind of thing because it's not the side of the empire we want to hear about. And so we don't understand the roots of violence that still run within our culture. We don't understand how deep those roots go and why it is that an attack will not eradicate whatever threat may or may not be there. We don't understand why Afghanistan is now starting to become Afghanistan because we have not dealt with the roots of the violence. We have not approached the violence in a way that leads to tackling true security. Carl Jung said, we need to remember that our ego selves, our small selves in the field of consciousness, ultimately rests on the deep self, the great self, the God self, that of God that within, the Buddha nature. But in between, in the middle, it's a shadow self, our dark side, that stops us from seeing our connection to the divine. And as long as we deny the shadow side, as long as we think we haven't got a shadow, the shadow will trip us up. The problem is not that you and I have our shadow sides, the problem is when we deny our shadow sides. And Jung therefore said that modern humanity doesn't understand how much our rationalism has put us at the mercy of the psychic underworld. We have freed ourselves from superstition, or so we believe, but in the process we have lost our spiritual values to a positively dangerous degree. Our moral and spiritual traditions have disintegrated, and we are now paying the price for this breakup in worldwide disorientation and dissociation. So I put it to you that the fundamental problem of our times is that we have become spiritually disconnected. We have become disconnected from the deep forces of life as love made manifest. And that is why it plays out in war, in the consumerism that drives climate change, in poverty in our cities, and so on. Anthony de Mello, the Jesuit spiritual thinker, an Indian, said, do you know where wars come from? They come from projecting outside of us the conflict that is inside. Show me an individual in whom there is no inner self-conflict, and I'll show you an individual in whom there is no violence. So can we tackle the violence within ourselves if we're going to tackle it in others? Can we recognize the problem? Think of that model of Jung's. The ego floating like a little ball on the ocean of the unconscious, both personal unconscious and collective unconscious. And then what happens when archetypal matter, when deep motifs, mythological matter, comes up from the unconscious and inflates the ego and gets into our ego so that we think we are Superman or whoever it is here, Zemo, you've pushed me too far this time, says Captain America. Archetypal inflation of the human ego. Same on the other side, Saddam Hussein here, represented as King Nebuchadnezzar, the hammer of the Jews. 
riding his chariot with the Lion of Babylon at its head and the battleships and armory of modern war around him. Archetypal inflation of the ego. A form of mass psychosis, as Jung suggested. And the problem now is that more and more we have conflation of actual reality involved in the killing of other human beings with virtual reality. There's a book called Death's Dream Kingdom that talks about the conflation of violence and depth psychology. And so the killing of Obama, or of Bin Laden, I'll say, the killing of Obama being watched in the White House by remote control. And I don't know how many of you have seen the film Zero Dark Thirty that is based on the killing or the hunt and the eventual killing of Bin Laden. But what most fascinated me about that movie is that the name given to the starring character is Maya. And Maya is Sanskrit for cosmic delusion. In Hindu theology, the roots of evil are Maya. Maya, delusion, ignorance, is the root of evil. What a statement to be making, <coughs> crafted into the context of that movie, that Maya is what causes new heads to spring up on the hydra when one is cut off. And I leave the military with this reflection, that the Greeks talked about the quality of arete, or all-round excellence, all-round excellence, and a general means a generalist in the military, somebody who's able to take an overview of things. And Keto, writing of the Greeks, says that the hero of the Odyssey is an excellent all-rounder. He or she has surpassing arete. The Greek hero tried to combine in themselves the virtues which our own heroic age divided between the knight and the churchman. I put it to them that perhaps the skills of the churchman, or at least the spiritual thinker, needs to be brought into a critique of what brings true security. I leave them with this image here of Le Bon Samaritain, the Good Samaritan by a French artist. This image that goes beyond arity, that goes into a compassion that is a compassion of the cross, a compassion that is a total outpouring of self, of love, for the other. And I match it with Gandhi's statement, his reflection on Satyagraha, that the world rests upon the bedrock of Satya, or truth. Asatya, meaning untruth, also means non-existence. And Satya, or truth, also means that which is. If untruth does not so much as exist, its victory is out of the question. And truth, being that which is, can never be destroyed. This is a doctrine of Satyagraha in a nutshell. That is why I would hope, and I hope they would hope, that as well as teaching the arts of war, this college and these people might one day teach the arts of peace. And I thank them for having me and others, like Paul Rogers from the Bradford School of Peace Studies, Scylla Ellsworthy, people like that who come there to talk about these issues. At least they're open to it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this was one day a school completely focused on peace as we would understand it? The ultimate moral underpinning, according to the army's own standing orders, the best form of discipline which the army expects of you is self-discipline. 
I leave them with a reflection from the Hadith of Islam. The most excellent jihad is that for overcoming the ego. And from the Judaic tradition, Isaiah, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning shooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Lest we forget.